Good evening. This is the art exhibit and meet the artist event for Ted Gormley. And this is the Virginia Beach Public Library. My name is Sandy Hopkins, adult services librarian for the Meyer E. Overmore Central Library. And I will be your host along with Robert Kennedy. He is the volunteer art gallery coordinator for the Central Library. And on the screen, you can see Robert's contact info. He is the contact person for art exhibits through the Virginia Beach Public Library. And now I'm going to turn this over to Rob, who's going to give us a little background on the artist. Thanks, Sandy. Welcome to all. We appreciate you joining us this evening for the first virtual Meet the Artist event. We are very pleased to have photographer Ted Gormley with us. He will be showing and discussing a series of black and white photographs. As you will see, they demonstrate his strong compositional choices that result in a stark, quiet beauty. If you have any questions for Ted, then you can type them at any time in the Q&A box, and he will answer them after his presentation. Ted has been, in his own words, crawling around in the dirt with a camera since receiving a Yashica rangefinder as a gift when he was 13. Ted graduated from the High School of Art and Design in Manhattan and attended Queens College, City University of New York, majoring in fine art photography. While continuing to develop his photographic skills over the years, Ted spent his professional career as a New York City firefighter. Now retired in Virginia Beach, he is refocusing his time on exhibiting and talking about his art Good evening, Ted. Thank you very much for joining us. We're now going to join Ted's presentation already in progress. And so another common thing that I shoot is shipwrecks. I'm drawn to shipwrecks for some reason. <laughs> and uh, this is a recent wreck. This is in Norfolk, Virginia. This you can see when you're on 64 going towards the tunnel to Hampton. Uh, this is in Willoughby Bay. Um, someone bought a sailboat, and from the story I heard, they didn't want to spend the money to moor it overnight or something like that, and they they just anchored it in the bay, and it broke free, and then ran aground, and and this is where it is now. So uh, last winter, I paddled over there on my kayak, and I took a bunch of pictures, and this is this is the best one that I got so far. I would like to go back and get better pictures of this, but last time I saw it, the masks were gone, so it doesn't look like this anymore. But this is a pretty cool shot if I do say so myself. <laughs> and uh, I try to, I have a long exposure here, so the sky is a little bit blurred, the, the clouds and everything like that. It's still winter, no leaves on the trees. Next we have um, some bad weather conditions. This is in First Landing State Park in Virginia Beach. This is looking out towards the um, Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, which you can see on the bottom there. And this is a really bad storm that rolled in where some, some of us were photographing on the beach. And this is really like cool, this looked really cool when it was coming in. It like it actually kind of looked like this. Like it looked like someone was painting like this brush strokes over the sun. It looks almost like a watercolor picture. And I, I love going out in this stuff. I'm surprised I haven't been hit by lightning yet, but um, I'm always out in this stuff. And uh, I should be out in this stuff now. It's you know we have thunderstorms rolling through here, <laughs> but um, so yeah, this this weather is uh, good for photography. Here's another one. This is back in Queens. This is looking from Rockaway out to Brooklyn. I actually cropped this from another picture. There was some cool things going on. There was a bridge that was never open that opened. There was a lightning bolt, but the composition was terrible. And I think the important thing about this picture is the clouds. This is about two in the morning and it's dark and these clouds are being lit up by lightning from inside. And it, it was pretty cool. And I think this is probably like a three or four second exposure. If you look really, really close, you can see the clouds moving a little bit. But I like I like stuff like this, and I want to try to shoot more lightning in clouds, like in kind of an abstract way, um, because it's pretty it's pretty interesting. You can get some cool effects, especially in black and white too. This is 
in Queens also. This is an example of why you should always have a camera with you and an example of why you can have a tiny little obsolete camera. I was driving and it was there was a really bad snowstorm. It was about 10 degrees out and I turned around and I saw this image and I jumped out of my car with no jacket or anything like that with a little Nikon J5. It's like a one inch sensor. And I snapped off a few shots and I got this and I can print this about 18 by 24 with no grain and no noise or anything like that. Um, I'll talk about cameras a little later, but um, yeah, this is a nice windblown snowstorm in a parking lot in the winter. This is what you get when you live in a beach town when no one's around, you get some cool scenery. And this shot is, if people don't recognize this, this is after Hurricane Sandy in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, a um, roller coaster, well, an entire amusement park that was on a pier, slid off the pier in the hurricane and ended up in the water. And this roller coaster was sitting in the water like this, right, with the breaking waves and everything. It was like that for a couple of months before they removed it. This is very heartbreaking to a lot of people. A lot of people spent their, their childhood here and uh, a lot of people I know. I've never been there myself, but except to take this picture. But um, this was this was a bad thing for a lot of people, aside from losing their homes and stuff. This is Hurricane Sandy was really was really a traumatic thing for the Northeast. But this shot, I actually I practically begged a cop to be allowed on the beach, take a couple of pictures, and he let me. And he was standing behind me while I was taking these pictures. And then finally, he was like, "All right, you got enough pictures. It's time to go." So I thanked him and I left. And this was this was a shot that I got. I wish I could have spent more time with it, but I don't want to get arrested. And then we have another image from Hurricane Sandy. This is down the street from where I lived on Staten Island when I was up there. And this is a water tanker that was, it was docked about a quarter mile from here. And the owner of the boat was nervous that it was going to get damaged in the hurricane. And he took it out into New York Harbor and anchored it out there. It broke free of its mooring and then washed up on the street. And this is where everyone found it in the morning. Um, and it eventually had to be scuttled. They had to they had to scrap it and take it apart. But um, who knows um, if it would have fared better if they uh, if they left it where it was moored. But uh, this is a shot that I got of it. And it's pretty, you know, it's pretty something to see. Driving down the street, and all of a sudden there's, there's a ship on the road. It was there for a couple of weeks before they were able to pull it off. And here's another shipwreck. You'll see a bunch of shipwrecks. If you don't like shipwrecks, this might not be the presentation for you. <laughs> um, this is currently a ship that is slowly sinking to the sand off of in, uh, Hatteras State Park down in North Carolina. Um, this ran aground in, I think, the end of very end of February. Uh, someone bought this in Virginia, I believe, and they were going to take it down to Texas to refit it and put it back into service as a fishing trawler. I think it was a shrimp boat or something like that. And he he ran aground in one of the sandbars that is out here. Um, the Outer Banks is called the Graveyard of the Atlantic. There's something like 2,000 shipwrecks off the coast of North and South Carolina. Sometimes during hurricanes, they'll come up out of the sand and then disappear again. So this ship was, um, excuse me, sorry. This ship was ran aground, it was about 50 yards offshore. I got a couple of pictures of it and everything got locked down with quarantine. And then as soon as everything opened up again, I came back and it looked like this. So in, in about a month, it sank, like about half the ship is under the sand now. So I, this isn't too far from me. So I go back here about once a week or so. I, I haven't been back there in about two weeks, but I'm trying to get back here to shoot this throughout its whole process. I'm gonna shoot this until it's obvious that it's stable or I get the shot that I'm really looking for or it disappears. So this is a shot that I got recently and um, the sun had just gone down. You can see stars um, in the background there. And it's pretty, it's, you know, it's, I like to also not have any real evidence of time or place. You know, there's no people around, there's no signs. There's no, you know, this could be anything. This could be like Planet of the Apes type stuff, you know, with the Statue of Liberty was sticking out of the sand at the end. So this is another thing I do with my photography. I kind of remove any time frame from it. It could be any time, any place. And here's another shot of the same ship from the other angle. Um, this is at night, obviously. There, I'm trying to get a picture of this where the sky is kind of partly cloudy and the stars are poking through. And I thought I was going to get that this night and the moon was out and the moon kind of ruined everything. And I actually didn't like this shot to begin with because there are some hard shadows on the ship from the moon. But it's kind of grown on me a little bit. So I kind of like it. It's, I guess, my second favorite picture of this ship so far. This one being the first, obviously. Um, so shipwrecks, more shipwrecks. This is in Virginia Beach. This is down the street from my house. You know, we are lucky here that when the storms roll in, we can just go down to the beach and watch them because they all come from the north. And then when it gets too bad, we all run home. 
And uh, I got a couple of good shots of the storm. And I think it looks good in black and white. People ask me, like, why do you do shots in, with lightning in black and white? And I say, because I want to. And um, the, I, I think that the tones and the texture of the clouds are a lot more, it, it looks a lot more three-dimensional when it's just black and white. And this is a pretty cool shot. And there was a ship in the background there. I didn't do some more lightning in black and white. This, this came out pretty good. And here is the back of Lincoln's head. And it's not a joke. Um, <laughs> there is a place, there was a place in Williamsburg where they had huge, I mean, a lot of people may know this, they had these huge statues of all the presidents and they were in a park and these big concrete busts and the park closed for renovations and they moved all these statues to private property and they're all like basically piled in a row and they give private tours of this place. And unfortunately they had to break all the heads of the presidents open to lift them up and put them on their truck with the crane. So all the statues have like holes in the tops of the heads and stuff like that. But I went on a photo tour and we got to shoot this place all afternoon and into the night. And it was really impressive. It's a cool place. Um, you can look up, I think it's abandoned Virginia. There's a photographer named John Plushall. He organizes uh, tours here because he knows the owners of this property. And it's a, it's a, it's interesting. I don't think there's anything else like it around. And uh, I got this shot obviously after the sun went down. This is my favorite shot from that day. And it translates into black and white really well. I do have some color ones that are pretty good too, but we'll save that for a different exhibit. I kind of like how the stars come through his head. A little, little bit morbid, but it's, it's all right. And this is when my friends are out in Pongo shooting sunsets and I'm not really a sunset guy. So I turn around and see what else there is to shoot. And uh, these are contrails of planes lit up in the sun as it was going down. And I kind of like how the reeds are pretty blurry because they were moving in the wind, but the contrails are nice and sharp. And this prints very well. This looks, this looks nice in print. So this is, this is what I do when the sun's going down. I don't, I don't really shoot a lot of sunsets. And here is an abandoned amusement park in West Virginia that also gives tours and you can camp there and you can go on ghost hunts and take pictures and stuff like that. It was a, kind of a small amusement park and it's a pretty impressive place and the people that run it are really nice. And this is obviously a Ferris wheel that's been overgrown for God knows how many years. And I was waiting for the clouds to get into this position too. I got a couple of shots here and I think that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good contrast between the overgrown Ferris wheel and these strange clouds just moving off in one direction. Here's another shot of that amusement park, or part of the amusement park. You know, these creepy rotting swings in the foreground and that Ferris wheel, you get a better view of what that Ferris wheel looks like. And this was in the summer. We got eaten alive. Thankfully, we had a lot of deep woods off. It was, there were a lot of bugs. <laughs> so this is, I, I, love, I love places like this and it's, it's fun trying to find these places and getting to go to them. And here is me when I first moved here, I would drive down 113 and then miss the turn for 13. And I'd keep going 113 for like a half a mile. And it turns into, you just turn into like a corporate park. And I was like, I was, I knew I was lost. I turned around, I saw this image. I got out, luckily I had my camera equipment with me. I took a couple of pictures. This is um, where the, there's a rail line that goes, that follows 13 and eventually crosses over 13 and goes wherever it goes. But this is kind of where it crosses 13. And um, I took, took a couple of shots of this. I'm, I was pretty happy with this. This is just an old signal tower. And I planned on going back there when the weather, when the springtime came, this is in the winter, I was like, this is going to be great. All this stuff is going to be grown in. There's going to be leaves, flowers and all this stuff. So I went back, I drove the two hours up there, went back, found it, and it looked just like this. So all those trees are dead. So <laughs> it would have been, uh, you know, I maybe should go back and plant some stuff. So in 10 years, it'll look nice and I can get the shot I wanted to get. But uh, so that's, uh, yeah, it's just as if you, if you missed the turn going south on 113, and keep going until you cross the tracks and see a corporate park, you'll, you'll find this. Make some pretty good pictures. And this is Norway. Uh, in the end of February, we went to the Lufoten. Lufoten, they, it's spelled Lofoten, they pronounce it Lufoten. I still don't know how to do it properly, but um, we went to the Lufoten Islands, Lufoten Islands, and it's a really remarkable place. It's, it's a little island chain, like right on the, the north coast of Norway. It's above the Arctic Circle. But the way the weather and the currents run, it stays kind of warm for the Arctic Circle. Like the, the you can, you know, the temp, you can walk around without a coat sometimes here. The temperature gets into the 40s. It rarely goes below freezing. And um, we didn't go there that week. 
we had <laughs> snow and blinding rain and 40 mile an hour winds. And when the weather did clear up, we all ran outside. So this is one of the good shots that, I mean, I got a lot of, we got good shots. It was still really good weather for it. So this is, um, this is near Hamnoy. And this is the foreground here. You see a fish drying rack. It's about three stories high. Norway, I think, provides the world with like a third of the codfish. And what they do is they catch fish. They hang it up on these racks. They cut the heads off and they hang them up and they just naturally, they naturally ferment in the wind and cold and they ship them all over the world. But you have mountains like this that just rise right out of the ocean. Like you have ocean and then mountains. And then it's, it's like hundreds of miles of this. It's gorgeous. And this is what it looked like most of the time we were there. This is outside of the, one of the houses we stayed in. And uh, very, this is not a technically proficient, well, perfect shot. Um, it's a little bit blurry, but don't look at it too close. It's a little bit, you know, the shadows are blocked out and stuff. It's, but I think the mood of this overrides any technical things. You know, I like I like the shot a lot. And this was kind of what we saw for most of the week that we were there, weather like this. And a lot of my pictures have a really like, like old antique kind of look to them. Like these could have been shot in the 1800s. A lot of the shots I got there, I mean, they came out pretty good. It was, I recommend everyone go here. And in the summertime, the water gets up to like 60 degrees. You can even swim in the water there. It's a beautiful place and it's not that expensive. It's just, it's just a long, it was like over 24 hours traveling. And it's just in Norway. And here's another Norway shot. This is a cemetery, obviously, um, just nestled in these mountains right on the beach. And very, you know, you can tell no one was here, very quiet, snow was unbroken, no footsteps. And we were like, you know, kind of walking around, like making sure everyone got their shot before someone stepped in. So we'd have no, you know, footprints ruining anything. And when you're in this cemetery and you turn around, you see this because it's pretty much right on the beach. And while we were shooting that cemetery, I was looking at the sky and I'm like, something's going to happen in a few minutes. And eventually the sun came out just on those mountains in the distance. And I ran down to the beach. I got a couple of these shots and then the clouds went back up again. Uh, they, they, the sky closed back up again and we went on to the next place. But I'm glad I got the shot. This is one of my favorite shots I got from Norway. It's, it's really, it, it, pictures don't do the place justice. It's just, it's great. It's insane. And this, going back to the U.S., this is San Francisco. This is at Land's End, at the end, well, it's at the end of Land's End, San Francisco. It's called the Sutro Baths. This is part of the Sutro Baths. It was an enormous saltwater swimming complex where they had, like, swimming pools and diving boards and all kinds of stuff like that. And it burned down in the 50s, as these things do. <laughs> they tend to burn down in the 1950s. And this is what's left. It's only the stone stuff, the steps, the foundations. And it's a pretty popular destination for photographers and tourists and stuff like that. And I, I go back to San Francisco fairly often um, to visit friends and stuff and eat all their food. And I go back and I always go here and I, I visit here and I shoot here. And this was from 2017. Um, and yeah, this is this is right up my alley, like ruins, stone stuff, you know, stairs in the middle of nowhere, breaking waves. But this is just after sunset, so it's a little bit of a time lapse. And it's a nice contrast between the rocks and the ocean. We'll see when I go back there, see what kind of shots I get. Every time I go back, things are a little bit more crumbled. Like that wall down there on the bottom was intact last time I was there before this. And now we move up the coast to Astoria, Oregon. The Pacific Northwest is one of my favorite places in the world. It's, it's just gorgeous up there. There's so much stuff to do. Um, and this is Astoria on the Columbia River, right at the end of the Columbia River. This is where the Goonies was filmed. This is where Kindergarten Cop was filmed. It's a really nice town. It's like on the like on the side of a hill, and there's all kinds of good restaurants and breweries and stuff like that. It's a really cool place to visit. There's docks with seals that will keep you up all night if you keep the windows of your hotel open. So this is um, some type of machinery. I don't know what it is that's in the water. There used to be a dock here, obviously. And I, I've been waiting. I first saw this in 2006, and I'm like, I got to get a shot of that someday. And every time I went back, there were, the conditions weren't ideal for whatever reason. I didn't have time. And finally, a couple of years ago, I was back and I saw the, and I'm like, all right, everything's going to be nice today. Let me go down with my tripod. And I got this shot. And there's going to be more stuff like this soon. Common theme of my work. This is up the road from that last shot. This is the bridge that goes across the Columbia River from Astoria, Oregon, up to um, to Washington towards Cape Disappointment. It's a really high, narrow bridge, but um, we were underneath it and the clouds were moving. So you can see the clouds are kind of blurry in this picture and you can see the Big Dipper right there in the left corner. So it was, it was a good night for this type of photography. Nice clear clouds, with, you know, clear skies with fast moving clouds. 
Let me spend some time here. And then this is also an Astoria. This is just, it was like an empty lot with a bunch of derelict cars and of course shipwrecks. So I took pictures of it. And this is, uh, there was some pretty cool clouds in the background. You can see them, they're just kind of like sweeping up and then stopping. And the ship in the front, like it almost looks like in like an outline, like I pasted it in, but that's actually what it looked like. And let's see if there's another shipwreck. Yes, this is up the coast or down the coast a little bit from Astoria. This is in Fort Stevens. I believe this is where Lewis and Clark got to the Pacific, if I'm not mistaken. But um, this ship is the Peter Iredale. This is a really popular tourist attraction also. This was like a some type of 100 foot iron sailing vessel that washed up in a storm and they just unloaded it and left it there and just been rotting over the years. And all that's left is basically this front part of the bow and then some, some stuff behind it. But I also, another thing I do whenever I go back there, I, I reshoot this again to see if I can get an even better shot. And um, I'm pretty, this isn't the last time I shot it, but this, I'm pretty happy with this picture. Everything was kind of right that day. Maybe I'll get a better picture even next time. Look, it's another shipwreck. So we're back to the East Coast now. And this is in Staten Island, New York. There is a ship graveyard on the West Shore of Staten Island. And it's um, basically in the 1950s, like the mid 50s, there's a, there's a marine company called Don John Recycling. I think they're like the second largest marine scrapper in the world. They own 80 acres of the shore, the ocean front or the, the bay front, whatever you call it, yeah, the Arthur Kill. And for a long time, they just collected boats to, to recycle and scrap. And, and at one point they had the whole entire 80 acres of waterfront about, you know, 100 yards out was just packed with boats and you could walk from one boat to the other and there was even a picture of it in national geographic i forget when it was it's was like 1984 march 1984 something like that and since then like they stopped collecting boats and since then they've been slowly getting rid of them but it's still a pretty impressive place you can't get there via land it's all private property so people come here in kayaks and canoes and stuff like that and i went there to photograph all these ships i actually did a lecture on this place there's a lot of historic boats here but we'll see more in a second this is an old barge that uh, just has its deck all twisted up and this is also this is a ferry called the sewell's point and this is these all these next few pictures are in the ship graveyard in the area around it um this was an east river ferry that was brought over here when it was you know at the end of its useful life and you, you, you're able to paddle through the bottom of this at one point, but it's since collapsed so much that you can't get into it. So um, this is a ferry. This is a ship, as far as I know, called Yog 64. This was this ship was part of the nuclear testing at the at Bikini Atoll in the Pacific at Kowala II, and they scrubbed all the radiation off of it and sold it, and it went up and down the East River until it ended up here in the ship graveyard. And that is the back of that ship, Yacht 64, just sticks out of the water. It's tempting to want to go on here and climb around. And at one point it was probably okay to, but this is just a huge, you know, collapse potential. You wouldn't catch me dead walking around one of these right now. No one would even know you're there. <laughs> Here's another ship in the ship graveyard. This is called the Bloxham. This was a tugboat that I think it was, I don't know the history of it, but it's a big old red tugboat and it's half sunk in the water. Here's an old Staten Island ferry, which was also in the ship graveyard for a while. And um, there was a big sign that said no trespassing, but um, my friend got permission from the owner. So we went on here and we woke around, took some pictures. And this funny story is I took these pictures the next week, I got a much better camera and I went back and I have to go back and retake these shots. And I went back and they had taken it away to scrap it so the ship doesn't exist anymore. And this is across from, if you look in the middle where all the lights are, that's actually where the ship graveyard is. This is from the New Jersey side. And this is something called a uh, McMiler coal dumper. And I think it's the only one of these left in the world. And what it would do is it would take, they would ship coal in from Pennsylvania and it would come here and you can see the tracks that they would drag these. There was something that would drag the, the coal cars up and an elevator would bring them up to where that boom is and that boom would lower and it would just flip the rail car over and dump coal onto the ship that was waiting there. And um, someone, you know, people are into this stuff and someone made a working model of this and you can find it on YouTube. It's called a McMiler coal dumper. And um, me, I would just go there and, you know, park my car and run around and take pictures. And that whole boom that sticks out has since collapsed. And I haven't been back there since. And there was an Osprey nest on top of that. It's a pretty impressive thing. It's probably about 13, 14 stories high. 
and that is on that's right under the boom of the coal dumper this here it's a bunch of machinery and looking out across there's a thunderstorm in the distance that's back towards staten island and there's another ferry there there's just abandoned ships all over the place here apparently that ferry was bought by someone and it broke down while they were moving it so they tied it up here and never came back from it for it so that was in like 1998 or something like that and it's got a spot you can't see it here and i don't have good pictures of it but there's a spiral staircase sticking out of the water on the end of that ferry and here's a security camera from that coal dumper it's kind of cool because the broken glass is a nice contrast to the sky. It's like almost like comic book looking. And this is up to the shore a little bit in Bayonne, New Jersey. This is some type of hopper, just like the thing in Astoria when this was a dock, you know, ships would pull up to this and I guess it would load or unload stuff from the ship. So you can see all the gantries in the background at the port. Um, it was pretty cool. It was snowing this night actually. And they used Photoshop to remove a whole bunch of little snowflakes. But it's pretty, pretty cool scene. This is another shot of it. And this shot is from Ohio. I was staying at my friend's place. They have about 80, 80 something acres in central Ohio. And uh, I woke up one morning and I looked out the window and I saw this and it was a little foggier. And I looked out the window again and it was a little less foggy. So I ran out in my underwear with my tripod and took a bunch of pictures in the cold and I, it was worth it. <laughs> so I got this shot. And then shortly after I was done with this shot, it, the fog completely cleared and um, you know, I went back to sleep. And that's the moon, by the way, not the sun. And this is on Staten Island. This is, I think, up in New York Harbor. This is right near the Staten Island Ferry. That's just a buoy in the water. We get a lot of good fog. New York gets the same type of fog as San Francisco, advection fog, I think it is. And it makes for some pretty dramatic scenery. And this was back when I got my first real digital camera. I got a Nikon D70 and I was riding my bike around a part of Brooklyn and I got a couple of shots. This was part of, uh, the old maritime shipping industry that is no longer really there. There's just an old warehouse. And for some reason, this whole row of lights was on. I got this. And just around the corner from that, there's a billboard at the entrance to the battery tunnel. I kind of like the way signs look when you can't see what the advertisement is. Just the structure of the sign itself sometimes makes for pretty good pictures. I might do a whole series on it someday. And this is with a six megapixel camera. So th this picture, I shot with a six megapixel camera. I re-edited it about a month ago. Um, it looks better than it did with, you know, with modern software like Nick, um, Nick Collection, I forget, Define, I think it is noise removal and stuff like that, and then Photoshop. And it, it produces a nice result. And then that is around the corner from the billboard. Cool how the light underneath and dark on the top. To get the paint, is it Matisse that has a picture of the uh, the building with the light, and it looks like it's night, and then above it is daytime. This was around the corner from my house when I lived on Staten Island. This was a church that had gargoyles on the tower, and they were doing construction on the church. And I think they tied the gargoyles off just in case something happened; they wouldn't fall. But uh, it was like this for a little while, and it was kind of a, it's kind of a cool look. It's just not something you see every day. So, of course, I waited till the night when the weather was crappy and I went out and took pictures of it. This is in Brooklyn. This was this was the Kosciuszko Bridge. This was part of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And they built a new bridge next to it and then dynamited the old bridge. And believe it or not, it didn't make the traffic any better. And honestly, I'm glad it's gone because it was a terrible bridge. <laughs> but this is what it looked like right after they dynamited it. They, um, I have another shot here. They just blew it up in sections and all the sections of the bridge collapsed. And it sat like this for a couple of weeks until they really, you know, tore everything apart and carted it away. So it made for pretty impressive pictures. I sat in traffic on this for a good part of my adult life, but not anymore. This is in New Jersey in Sandy Hook. This is um, just an abandoned building with snow that had blown in covering a bunch of two by fours. It's kind of cool walking through all the stuff in the snow and like they're just interiors of buildings that have like a layer of snow on everything. 
and I left the highlights kind of blown out in the window on purpose. I kind of like the effect of it. This is on Staten Island, more like, you know, evidence of old things that are rotten and gone. This is just rocks and pilings from some structure that, that are just in the water. This is in Brooklyn. This is in Marine Park, just, you know, old pilings, same thing. There's just, there's just old stuff everywhere. And, you know, they'll come up with something new. They'll build a bridge so they don't need the ferry dock anymore. So they just let it rot away. And then I come in with my camera. And um, interesting thing about this beach is that right in the middle of the picture, that, that end where, where the land is right there, that's actually a, a petroleum spill that's like 100 years old. And it reeks when the tide is out. It just, it just reeks like petroleum and oil and gasoline. But I don't think it's polluting the water anymore because it's all dry and stuff like that. But again, taking advantage of more fog, more of the New York fog. This is in Kipta Peak. This is um, up on top of one of the cliffs looking out towards one of the fish traps. Kipta Peak, Virginia, for those that don't live in Virginia, it's the bottom of the Eastern Shore. And then I think there's only a couple of these fish traps but they are very photogenic. What I was trying to go for here was the texture of the water. It was kind of a calm day, the really thin little waves and nice texture. This is in New York. This is at the end of Breezy Point, another beach shot, obviously, the shells. This is nice um, stratified layered composition. This is probably a half a mile from this, maybe more a little about, about a mile. These are, this is in Reese Park. This is a, the steps that go down to the beach. It looks like, they look bigger. It looks like some type, type of pyramid or something from this angle. But these are steps from the boardwalk that go down to the beach. I shot this many years ago also. This is like one of my college pictures. So this was film that was scanned. And this shot is the Falcon Heavy, um, the rocket that launched from Florida in 2018. I think this was the first flight of the Falcon Heavy. It was, um, this is the rocket that is eventually gonna take people back to the moon and eventually Mars and um, went down to Titusville and watched the launch across the water. And it's kind of cool because the contrail that the rocket exhaust made here is casting a shadow on the rest of the sky. It was a humid day out. So it's, it's a pretty cool shot. Not my usual type of subject matter to photograph, but it's you know well to photograph formally in print and frame, but it looks it looks pretty cool, and I recommend anyone see a rocket launch if you and have the chance at all go see a rocket launch. It's one of the most impressive things you'll ever see. And this is from my backyard. This is uh, the last lunar eclipse. This is looking up through the pine trees. I kind of left the pine trees blurry on purpose because everything else is nice and sharp, and it gives a nice depth to it. Um, not sure what to say about it, but it was pretty, I didn't, uh, apparently a meteorite hit the moon during this eclipse and you can see it on some people's pictures, but I didn't get that shot though. So this is meteor free. And then this is back in Queens. This is in Fort Tilden, more coastal defense stuff. Um, I don't know what this building housed, but now it just houses beach cleaning equipment and all the kids in the neighborhood throw rocks at the windows. And um, it just uh, just sits there and wastes away. It's part of the National Park Service, but you know there's 400 and something national parks, and there's only a limited amount of money to go around. So that everyone's fighting for funds, and not everyone gets funds. So if they don't get money to renovate stuff, they just put a fence around it, and what happens happens. And I think that's it. So I guess uh, we have questions and stuff. Yeah, that was great, Ted. I Thank you. It was Excellent uh, photographs, very, very interesting. Um, yeah, as Ted said, if you have any questions at all, uh, type them in in the Q&A box and uh, he'll be happy to answer them um, while people are doing that, hopefully. I was wondering if you had any uh, advice for aspiring photographers? Um, learn. 
learn learn as much as you can like there's so much to learn in any type of art especially photography there's so much to learn um i would say get the best camera you can afford get the best lenses you can afford but I, it's not like a primary thing like you know, like i said i've 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 got pictures here that were taken with a tiny little point and shoot that i frame you know enlarge and frame and print and um it's just like the more the more you learn the more you learn about your equipment and what you can do with stuff the more you can envision what you want to shoot when you're when you see something you can be like okay i know what i want to do with this so yeah def definitely learn and don't let anyone constrain you don't tell don't let anyone tell you that what you're doing is wrong or that you know photographers don't shoot that that's not real photography i've actually had professors that told me that it, what i do is not real photography which is a shame but um yeah that's good advice yeah thank you we do have a question here um do you convert the images to black and white in editing and if so do you try to visualize the scene in black and white when shooting so yes i shoot my my camera is set to shoot raw at the highest bit rate and um i let the, the machine make as little decisions as possible and uh, so it collects everything in color and everything like that. And then I open the file in Adobe Camera Raw, and then I convert it to black and white after I do all the lens corrections. And and uh, so yeah, sometimes when I shoot stuff, you know, if I go out to shoot, like my mind is just open. You know, most of the time I'm thinking about what would this look like in black and white, but it doesn't always work out like that. So um, I do convert it when I'm post processing. Okay, good. Actually, you might want to talk a little bit about. Um how you sell your uh, photographs if people are interested in purchasing uh, that uh right now i have a website but um so so with my with these black and white prints um if people want to buy them uh the best thing to do is email me you can see my email address right there ted at tedglomley.com and uh, we'll discuss pricing and sizing and stuff like that and they are printed as like they're printed on demand for the most part if i don't have any what they want printed at the time um, I use a process called, and hopefully if these guys will watch me, hope I pronounce it right and describe it correctly. Sorry, John and Kathy. Um, it's called piezography, and it's a method of digital printing using, using specially developed carbon pigments that are, and that are run with special software through high-end Epson printers. And it produces stuff like, you know, better stuff than I can get in a dark room. And um, they make they make nice images, really nice tones, like almost unlimited tones and shades and gradations. And those get printed, like, unless I'm showing something, like those get printed as people want them. Like I send the file up to Vermont where the studio is and they, they print them for me. Okay. And you can email me and we can discuss. Okay, very good. Uh, another question, do you use a cable release or timer to shoot the night images and long exposures? I use a timer and a tripod during the day. <laughs> I'm that guy. Uh, yeah, I, I use, I, I always use a tripod as much as I can. I, like I'm a, I'm a maniac for, for like sharp, like the image has to be sharp. Uh, so yeah, I use a tripod as much as I can. And what I personally do right now is, is I will use, um, I, I set the shutter on a, a delay um, I'll use live view so the mirror flips up. It's a it's a feature on Nikon cameras where you can like look at the screen and it will show you what the lens sees. Because even with some exposures, like even if you have a cable release or a remote shutter or something like that, just the act of the mirror flipping up and then down again, if the exposure is short enough, like a half a second, one second, something like that, there can still be some motion. So I, I had the mirror flipped up beforehand and then I use a remote shutter. So throughout the whole process, I'm not touching the camera. Okay. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, uh, any other questions? Again, feel free to uh, type them in there and Ted can answer them. And I can go back to specific pictures too. Oh, okay, sure, very good. Yeah. Oh, how do you find such uh, unique places? Uh, Google Maps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a lot, a lot of places that I that I go to, like I just, you know, I just I go places. Like if I travel, if I'm driving somewhere, I'll bring a bicycle with me if I can fit it in my truck, and I'll just ride my bike around, um, like. You know the the places in New York City. I mean, it's it's where I grew up, so like I know about a lot of the stuff there, and I found out about that ship in the Outer Banks on the news, and some places. Um, yeah, I mean, and I made a joke about Google Maps, but like really, sometimes you just scour a coastline using Google satellite view, 
and you see some interesting stuff and then you go see what's there. And sometimes it's nothing and sometimes it makes for some cool images. Do you have any uh, future plans for your photography? Any place you'd like to go perhaps that you have not been? Uh, I was any goals to, that you have? I was supposed to go to Namibia in April uh, to the Skeleton Coast on a photography trip, but it got postponed because of the virus. And uh, we were supposed to go for a week to the Skeleton Coast. It's a part of Namibia where ships have been washing up for years and years. And there's some really cool stuff there. There's some interesting wildlife. There's, you know, sand dunes go right to, down to the beach. Um, so I'm really looking forward. It was postponed a year. So April 2021, I'm going to be going there. And I, I really hope it's not postponed again. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, um, I'm trying to get uh, more into printing and framing and then finding the proper venues to sell, the galleries, stuff like that. So I'm kind of gearing that up. You know, it's you know process of you know, curating my images, like what I want to print, what would look good, you know, as a body of work. So I'm, I'm kind of gearing up to do that, finding exhibits, giving internet presentations. <laughs> Sounds good. And you'll be able to see Ted's uh, photographs uh, next year in the next season when the library is open, we hope. And uh, also all the artists who we unfortunately had to cancel shows. Um, and uh, uh, someone's saying he can't wait to see them in person. So that's good. Thank you. I, I'm also wondering um, if you have any photographers, either of the past or present, who have been in, influential or inspirational uh, to your photography? Uh, well, aside obviously from Ansel Adams, um, there's a guy named Michael Kenna who's he's when I saw his stuff he's he's probably he's very well known landscape photographer also his stuff is just it's it's like mesmerizing he does a lot of really moody atmospheric landscapes and low light or at night he has like hour long two hour three hour long exposures um very like dreamy and quiet and still uh his his images were really like he was he kind of like seeing his stuff was like, like I was, you know, you have doubts about your work and you know, is what I'm doing good enough? Is this stupid or whatever? And you see his work and it's like, wow, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, I can keep doing what I'm doing. Cause I had, I, I think some of my stuff is kind of similar in feeling to what he does. And he's in, he's influenced me a lot. So yeah, definitely Michael Kenna. Okay. Oh, great. Very good. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, do you have any formal art training? Um, and perhaps the uh, questioner means beyond your degree in fine arts photography. Uh, uh, she loves all the textures and patterns and use of light. Well, I, I went to high school for art and I didn't major in photography in high school. I actually majored in um, like, like drafting and interior like design, like um, like an architectural side, like learning, uh, to, like render, render different building materials and stuff like that and drawing elevation il illustrations and stuff. I majored in that and in uh, college, um, I didn't actually finish college because uh, I, I became an EMT and then a firefighter. Um, but after that, like after college, I always like I took classes. I, I had a darkroom for a while. I was taking like adult classes in this place in New York where I had a darkroom that I could use. And I go to workshops, I go to seminars, you know, I listen to people talk, I read. I go to um, all the stuff for, you know, learning how to use Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw and the printing process for what I do. And so I'm constantly learning. Oh, good. Well, yeah, it shows you have an excellent eye for design and composition. Thank you. Any yeah. other questions for Ted? I was I was going to say, if, oh, if sure. I said, like for people who like, like for me anyway, like I don't just look at other photographers like you look at painting also because a lot all the principles are the same especially for landscape stuff there it's all the same stuff it's all composition and the use of light and everything like that you're just using a different medium yes so def definitely helpful to look at like i'm, I'm influenced there's a, there's a type of painting called luminism mm -hmm. and um, it basically um it's kind of like an offshoot of the hudson river school and like where they use like light is almost as a subject of the picture it's like very very still serene highly detailed atmospheric moody pictures and um you know people painted this stuff to try and get people to go west and uh yeah. but it's um you know I, I get a lot of inspiration from different types of painting great great any other uh, questions for Ted? Okay. 
Um, uh, anything else you want to add? You want to uh, talk about uh, some of the cameras that you use, the technology, or yeah, I, um, I've always I use mostly Nikon cameras, and well, my first my first camera was a Yashica, um, but when I when I uh, got to college, I got a Nikon sixty oh six, and I've always used Nikon since then. I have nothing against any other camera, and I've had other camera brands, but there's always like this. Nikon Canon debate. It's like Ford and Chevy. It's like, <laughs> but um, I've had Canon cameras. I've had Olympus cameras. I have an Olympus camera, but I use mostly Nikon cameras. My DSLRs are Nikons. Um, I started out with a D70S and now I have a D850. And I use it right now. I use a D850 and a D810. And my, for stuff in the water, I have a couple of waterproof cameras. I have a Nikon AW1, which is a interchangeable lens, waterproof, shockproof camera. And it's from 2014. It's getting a little bit old, but it still takes really good pictures. And I have an Olympus um, TG6 that I use if I know I'm going to get wet. Um, so I have those cameras. I also, I really like the Nikon 1 series, which they don't make anymore. They're little like interchangeable lens, mirrorless one-inch sensor cameras. I have a couple of those with all the lenses. And they, they I, I like them. The little Nice little cameras, little compact, cool little lenses. Um, yeah, that's... Pretty much, yeah, I'm just uh, mainly Nikon stuff right now. And okay. I've been in a lot of their glass, so I'm probably going to stay with Nikon. I have no complaints about them. Well, very good. Do you ever print on uh, metal or metallic uh, paper or canvas? Or uh, do you yeah. use a specific type of paper? Or yeah, I actually use a specific type of paper to print. It's Canson. Uh -huh. I forget what it's called. It's, it's Canson rag. It's cotton rag. It's like a very white, thick paper. Uh -huh. And um, it takes it takes the pigments very well and has, you know, I like really I like my highlights to be really, really white. So I use like the whitest, like fairly thick, smooth paper that I can get. OK, very good. Uh, any other questions for Ted? Uh, Sandy? Um, would you like to share with him what some of the comments were in the chat box? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, good one. I, I thought maybe you could see them there. Uh, we I have turned off my chat box. Uh, one person saying, very moving, awesome shot. I believe this was for the beach, to one of the beach ships. Uh, the Lincoln, uh, very surrealistic, uh, very unique, uh, powerful image. And also that you find the most unusual places there as well. <laughs> so, uh, cool sometimes shot. places are right under your nose. I'm sorry. Sometimes these places are right under your nose. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But you see them. That that makes a difference. Not everyone sees. It's a learned skill. Yes. Yes. 